There it is again, the beautiful sounds of Mitch Fortner leading into the KSO show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you as we get ready for week number three of K-State football. The Wildcats on the road this weekend in Columbia to take on the Missouri Tigers. It is going to be uh, a much more interesting game, I would imagine, than what we saw last year. Uh, Bad weather, not going to be a thing in this game. Missouri probably a little bit improved from last year. And also, they're just a hungrier team than what came into Manhattan a season ago because they probably don't want to get stomped by the Wildcats again. That probably wasn't a very fun feeling for them. It's probably been a, a pretty strong point of motivation uh, as this uh, offseason and now this game week has come about. So we'll see what Missouri brings to the table. But, D.Y., I'll, I'll bring you in on this. Uh, wh- what has it been like this week seeing – how K-State has kind of prepared and gotten ready for Mizzou and kind of also seen the Missouri approach to this game. I mean, does it feel like now we've gotten the, you know, the first two weeks of patty cake out of the way with football season and now it's power five versus power five, two teams that are going to go at it pretty good. Absolutely. And, and, and the motivation to not want to get your ass kicked again is, is pretty high. So um, Missouri is certainly have this game circled. You, Eli Drinkwitz, said as much in his press conference that this is the game that they've been essentially um, had on their mind a lot all off season. So we'll, we'll see what that produces that approach. You know what? I, for Kansas state, you know, still, I still get some bitterness about Missouri, Missouri. Uh, ben Sinnott kind of didn't hold back. Yeah. He, he's, he was pretty vocal. I think he almost took it, and maybe this is a, a sentiment shared in the Kansas State locker room. I don't know. Almost a little bit offended that some people say, "Oh, you won forty to twelve. You won by four touchdowns. It was forty to six. You won by four touchdowns be- because it rained." Um, mm-hmm. I, I think in ways that they feel disrespected by that. Hey, play that card. <laughs> you know. People love the Michael Jordan disrespect card. I call it the Michael Jordan one because it's the last dance mm-hmm. and um, how he would search for that in any way possible, any avenue, even if it was contrived, made up in his head. Um, I think in a way, Kansas State's doing that. I don't think anyone's really disrespected their 40-12 to 12 win over Missouri last year. Maybe, maybe Missouri did. I haven't sensed that, but Ben Sennett certainly raised that point. Um I walked it back a little bit because I don't want a permanent non-conference game, but the bitterness between these two teams that has been showcased in the last 15 months, I would say, because Kansas State really enjoyed that win over Missouri last year. Like you had the whole billboard thing and everything, Mm -hmm. right? Like they really enjoyed it. Missouri's been pissed about it for forever. They've circled this game on the calendar. Like there's a part of me that says, man, and this is the regionality that we've lost in a sense, but I'm glad that we got at least got two matchups that like Kansas state and Missouri playing every year would be good for college football, but I don't know that it would be good for the Kansas state schedule to have a permanent non-conference game the way that Iowa state does with Iowa. Um, I think there's some good things about that, but I also think there's some bad things, right? You don't really get any novelty in your schedule whatsoever. I mean, Iowa state, Plays the same 10, 10 teams, 10 of the 12 games every year, the same same 10. And the the only two that rotate are an FCS opponent that's either Northern Iowa or Missouri State, and then the group of five opponent that's always from the MAC. Like there's there's little deviation for what Iowa State sees on their schedule. And from a season ticket order perspective, that's probably pretty boring for them. So I think I think I'm against permanent non-conference power five opponent, but I would be, if it became a scenario where some of these things happen to where you're just playing 11, 12 power five opponents, which power four maybe in the future. And I, I don't, and I don't know that that day's not going to get here. I think there's a, there's a chance where Kansas state schedule is like the buy game, so to speak for football. I don't know that those all always exist. And in a world where it doesn't exist, then I would welcome Missouri as a permanent non-conference opponent. I, I think that's a good point about this because these games have obviously been fun. The the, yep. the build up to them and everything that comes with it 
And we know that Colorado was on future schedules for K-State. That was going to be the same type of deal. I think that there is probably interest at some point it, once Nebraska is done scheduling through 2094 uh, to get, you know, have a K-State. Yeah, State too. <laughs> yeah exactly. To have K-State revive. I think Nebraska is, is the worst about it. I mean, I'd have to go look real quick, but I'm pretty sure that Nebraska has that thing loaded up. But th- th- these games are fun. This is more fun than K-State playing Mississippi State or Stanford. Like, those are Power 5 games. Those are always going to be exciting. And the ones that are marquee on a on a schedule when they come out, um, yeah, Nebraska's scheduled out to 2035, so not as bad. Yeah, as yeah they are. Year. I just looked that up, too. Nebraska plays Oklahoma State in both 34 and 35. Yeah, K-State's only scheduled out through 2031 when they get Rutgers on there. But it, oh, it's – Did you see that? There is a gap between 31 and 34. Oh, okay. All right. Well, <laughs> Gene, get on the phone. Call up Trev. Make something happen. People would enjoy it. Um, 32, 30, 2032, mark it on your counter, folks. Well, I mean, honestly, if you're if you're K State, you probably just say, "Hey, uh, we we can ditch Arizona and just play you guys next year." Like we don't care. Uh, we, I mean, we, it'd be perfect timing for K State. But what I was gonna say is, like, the the non con Power Five games are fun. But you're right. If this was like a yearly thing, I mean, it's a little different because K State is in such a good spot right now. But if you're putting a capable opponent that you're going to become familiar with every single year, number one, it might get a little bit boring if K-State and Missouri are, are regional rivals, former conference foes, but it's not like it. this is KU-Missouri. It's not like it's K-State, you know, who Iowa State, K-State, KU, or whatever, where it's you've built this thing over time. Like, it's been gone for a while. You don't necessarily need it. And what you run into the problem of, look at West Virginia the last couple of years. They've been playing two non-conference Power 5 games because they're trying to keep the regionality in their schedule and their rivalries. I mean, they were the sacrificial lamb for Penn State to start the season. Dumb move. Now they get Pitt this week, and they might beat Pitt because Pitt's not very good. But it's just it's not great, especially when you're playing a three-game non-conference schedule. It's tough to do that. So I, I get what you're saying. Honestly, the way that maybe it should work out, K-State – and now this doesn't benefit Missouri at all because they're the one that's caught in the middle of all of this, but it would be the idea of like, if you got like a rotation going and you said, okay, if KU and Missouri aren't going to want to play each other every single year, rotate it and say odd years, K-State and Missouri play, even years, KU and Missouri play, that's your non-con power five game. That'd probably be a great scenario for K-State and KU. It would not be good for Missouri. Missouri would not like that either. So these are fun but it's really tough to continue, and we're seeing this with conference realignment as well, that Oklahoma State and Oklahoma, they have no interest in playing each other now that they're going to be non-conference members for numerous different reasons. But it, it, is, it is fun when we get them. I think it might be more fun, though, when you get it every once in a while and you can kind of get that nostalgia back in, then you can tuck it away and then bring it out a few, few decades later. I'm a little different. I, I think the game itself, having them every year, Kansas State versus Missouri, would still be fun. I just think that there wouldn't be enough variation in your schedule with only two other games and one of them being an FCS opponent. That little variation would make the schedule in general not very fun. That would be my argument. But my other argument is I do think that the direction and the trajectory of college football in general is to the point where you might just be only playing power four opponents. Yes. Um, right now it's nine plus one. It could be 10 plus two at some point. Like they're what television is doing, not only are they reconfiguring conferences, they're basically saying the only games you are playing are going to be the ones that people want to see, which means the end of Kansas State first, an FCS opponent, and maybe the end of, a group of five opponent. We'll see what happens. But all I would say is like in a day where Kansas state's only going to play 12 power four opponents, I would probably be okay with the 10th game being a permanent crossover with Missouri. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think if, if it gets to that point and it's, Hey, we're only playing, you know, power five non-con games and the whole schedule is that, which it does feel like at some point that's where college football is going to go. It's, I mean, 
each change to the college football system, it becomes more and more like the NFL. Yeah. And you know, more games get added. TV TV is a big player in all this now yeah. where the SEC was not able to convince the or the the ESP was not able to convince the SEC this last time through to add another conference game. That may be something they're able to do later down the road. Or ESPN says, hey, ditch the cupcake game in week 12 and go ahead and play another marquee game like this. And I think all the other TV partners would follow suit because it's much better for them. I mean, you look at the ratings for these games, like the, the slate is so weak in these first couple of weeks of the season. Like Washington State, Wisconsin drew numbers last Saturday because – it just got thrown onto ABC at 6.30 because there was nothing else to do. The same thing is going to happen for West Virginia and Pitt this week. Those two teams have no business playing the Saturday night game on ABC, but they're going to be there, and they're going to get probably 2 million people watching it. So I think that there's going to be more and more talk and movement towards this happening for a lot of different reasons, and it also could have to do with the structure of the playoff changing. Like We know it's going to 12. With realignment and everything else, it may extend beyond that, and it might be smarter to go beyond that because eventually you are going to get to the point where these conferences are so big, you're avoiding certain teams, and you're going to have a team that goes 11-1 and one, or multiple teams that go 11-1 and one and feel like they should be in a playoff, and they'll be left on the outside looking in. It's going to happen in one of these years, so you might as well start to make this thing a little bit more NFL-y in how you do it. It's probably going to kill off the bull system, but – that's just kind of how it goes. Um, I, I'm fascinated to see where, where college football ends up. Now, this is all a bigger conversation for a later date, but it is something that makes you think at some point in time, these schedules are going to fill up to be a lot tougher where K-State's first two games of the year aren't always going to be FCS opponent, G5 opponent, and then your P5. You might have multiple P5s or eventually, like you said, all 12 of them are just Power 5 opponents. The television networks have basically spearheaded conference realignment because of television ratings. And the next thing that they'll kill off, which they've already kind of killed off regionality, so to speak, which is kind of what we've alluded to, Mm -hmm. although regionality does drive up ratings as well. They'll bring back regionality, so to speak, and basically replace regionality games as your non-conference contest because those those will be the ones that, are on the floor of your television ratings and get rid of these, you know, non-conference games that are commanding 200 to 400,000 viewers because it's just a waste of time. The television networks. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think you're right on that. So I, it, it's fun. We'll see how it goes. I mean, there are going to be more of these in K-State's future. And the good news is if you're a K-State fan and you're interested in any of this, Gene Taylor is having to scramble right now to help K-State fill what are presumed to be likely holes in the non-conference schedule with Colorado and Arizona. So you might get more of that in the near future. Or, I mean, we saw this year, Oklahoma and Georgia ended up without Power 5 non-conference games because their series was abruptly canceled uh, because they're conference mates now. So maybe K-State has a lull like the next two years and then when the Colorado series was supposed to be and you don't have Power 5 opponents. I don't... I think Kansas State's going to have to replace the Colorado ones, but with Arizona being so recent, it looks like it sounds like there's momentum for that series remaining a non-conference game, even as conference foes. Yeah, I that will be that will be one that is uh, fun and interesting to follow along with. Okay, let's uh, let's get into why we are here. That is to talk K State Missouri, the 15th ranked Wildcats on the road in Columbia this weekend. It is going to be, like we've talked about, the excitement for the game, the fans passionate about being there. But on the field, we have talked extensively about Luther Burden already this week, and he is probably one of the main areas that we will talk again about tonight. Uh, But we'll start with what is going to work in this game for K-State. We know that offensively, um, there have been some things that maybe worry a little bit. We'll we'll talk about those in in a moment, but... What is it about K-State's offense going into this game with Missouri that you're confident in it's going to work and they will be able to exploit Missouri because either K-State's that good or Missouri might lack in certain areas defensively? I don't know. And that kind of concerns me, right? Yes, I get that. Because, I, I mean, as I was asking you the question, I was saying to myself, it's not the run game right now that we can say that about with K-State because that's where the most questions are. Now, really – 
that's those are questions for the offensive line, but it's impacting the run game. And then also it's you know, K-State has thrown the ball well, but it's not like you can just go out and say they're going to be able to throw it all over the place on Missouri. This is not the kind of game where it seems like, at least at this point in time, we know K-State has any realm where they can go out and just assert their dominance. This is going to be a game where K-State just, I think the full 60 minutes you have to go out and prove that you are better than Missouri, which I believe they are, but it's not something where they're going to overwhelm the Tigers in any fashion. So, I, you know, we're probably at the stage of the season where it's tough to find something uh, that, that somebody's going, you know they're going to do well, and it's going to be a strength for them in this game. And it's a credit to Missouri a little bit. Like, I, not a ton of confidence in the running game at the moment just because the offensive line is still trying to get their footing in, for Kansas State. I can Then I look to, you know what, Missouri, not that this is a copycat league, but in ways it can be. I mean, I think people mm-hmm. copycat each other in football a lot. Missouri just saw Troy for a period of time give Kansas State trouble by taking away Ben Sinnott. So does Missouri try to mimic that strategy? I would say they probably will, right? Because mm-hmm. it was – you give up 42 points, but I would still call it a somewhat successful strategy, especially when maybe you don't have to commit additional hats in the running game. So then – if they can just take away the running game, and I don't know if they can, but let's say they, hypothetically that they can mm-hmm. without committing hats to the running game, and then they can take away Ben Sennett in the passing game because that's where they can commit the extra hats, then does Keegan Johnson have the ability to take off or does Jaden Jackson have the ability to take off? That's well, That's possible. But yeah. then they, what you run into a problem is Missouri probably has the best duo of quarterbacks in the entire SEC, which is saying something. So matchup-wise, I'm not sure this is exactly the most conducive situation for Kansas State. Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. I mean, it it, it is tough. I mean, we've we talked on Wednesday pretty extensively about – uh, Missouri is good defending the run. That's something to, to take note of, um, which, you know, isn't great considering, you know, where K-State's been in the run game and everything right now. But uh, now they've got capable defenders in, beyond that level. And, I mean, K-State has thrown the ball well. Will Howard has not been bad this year. But we know that there has been a couple of questions. And, you know, I think I used the term antsiness earlier in the week. It's made – K-State fans, and probably the coaches a little antsy as well, some of the decisions that Will Howard has made. And it's just one of those deals we're going to this. If if K-State is not sharp on offense at each position group, they will find themselves in trouble. And as we talked about uh, on Wednesday, that's the kind of thing you can't do against Missouri. They have proven that they will be in games and they can compete with anybody, no matter the talent differential, whether it's above them or below them, if – the opportunity is there. Missouri is going to keep a game close, and Missouri has the talent to, if this is a, a tight game with four minutes left, they have the talent to finish the job. They can make that happen. So this is, I mean, Chris Clement said it last week about their game with Troy. I think more than ever, this is the game where it's, hey, we just got to focus on ourselves and we'll be all right. Because even though Missouri is good in some areas, they're not so good that you have to freak out at least about their defense to me about oh we got to do this to to try and help ourselves here no you just got to go out there and take care of yourself if the offensive line blocks better than what they've done in the first two weeks and guys step up they will be fine in the running game I think we know that like you're not you you don't doubt the ability of Treshawn Ward and DJ Giddens do you no exactly no I don't don't, but if they can't run the ball then because Missouri is pretty good at it, and Kansas State just struggled against at it versus Troy. Then you run into a situation where, because they can probably take away Ben Sinnott if they want. Now they have to devote more guys to do that, but if they can, if they can just eliminate the running game on itself, they have to rely on their corners against Kansas State receivers, and it's probably a pretty good situation for Missouri. You'll take that. So what? In that scenario, what does Kansas State need? 
They need a brilliant game from Will Howard. So uh, rocket, not rocket science here, of course, but if Kansas State can't run the ball, I, I really think Will Howard needs to have an exceptional game, and I mean an exceptional game. Yeah, I think this is this has Will Howard game written all over it, and um, this is the kind of game where he has to go out and prove like all the the excitement and the hype and goodwill that was generated with how he played last year and why people um, in in a lot of different areas are so high on him and also confident that he is the the better of the two quarterbacks in the state of Kansas. Like this is the game where you go out and prove it, uh, where you yeah. can go out and, and get things done, and you're you're starting to have more and more guys available at, that can catch the ball for you. I mean, it's not to the same high level, but at this point in time in the season, Will Howard has more capable guys, at least to what it seems through two games that we've been able to see. He's got more capable pass catchers than what he had at any point last season. I mean, last season it was basically four, four guys you trusted to catch the ball. And even then, you know, you're a little iffy there, but it was, Ben Sennett, obviously, Malik Knowles, Kay Warner, and Phillip Brooks. Now, this year, you still have Ben Sennett. You still have Phillip Brooks. And Jaden Jackson has made plays, which was kind of the wild card in all of this. We didn't know how he would look. R.J. Garcia does look like he's putting together the pieces to match what everybody's expected. And we haven't seen him a ton, but Keegan Johnson did look good and like a trustworthy guy that can make plays for you when he was on the field. And all the offseason hype has been there. I mean, that's five guys instantly that you look at that are catching balls from Will Howard that you at least believe in at this point in time. So that's uh, the offense, at least from the passing standpoint, could be in a better position right now than what it was last year for K-State at any point, um, just based off the fact that you have more guys that can step up and make something happen for you. So um, I'm with you. I mean, this is a game on Will Howard right here for K-State, unless by, you know, some miracle that in a, a week's time the offensive line has corrected some of their woes. And I just, even though there, there's some talent there and Connor Riley is a good offensive line coach, I really have serious doubts that, that K-State is going to be able to fix that problem as fast as they as they would want. And it, and it doesn't sound like they're going to have Christian Duffy, which um, probably brings potentially the same problems as the first two games. It, yeah. And, and it's because of the standard that we expect from Will Howard, but the I mean criticism from for his performance through the first two games and I, and I understand that he, he's graded on a different standard any criticism is really nitpicking because yeah he's had a few plays where you're like man that's not the not the best choice to make um we're still two games in he's got nine touchdowns against yeah a, a an FCS team that's probably gonna make the playoffs and a group of five team that should comfortably advance to a bowl game. Yeah, and I mean, it's also been in games where for the most part, he's felt like there's been leeway there. And I'm sure that the message to him has been, hey, you can take some chances here. You can take more chances. Let's push it. Let's see what you can bring to the table and kind of get it, you know, rolling over the top. I, I think that's kind of the, um, the, the thing that you can take away there. Although it's at least worth monitoring. Like, keep an eye on it, and it's not to say that it won't happen that Will Howard makes some questionable mistakes. Okay, let's let's flip this around now. And, I mean, we, we, we've talked about it offensively, about concerns. I don't know that we need to dive into it. Like, it's offensive line, which in turn means the run game is a concern. Is there anything else offensively that worries you about heading into this game from with Missouri for K-State? Just if the receivers – falter against those really good Missouri corners, then then you have issues. But that's why the importance of Will Howard being really good is elevated for this particular contest. Like, I'm just going to put it, Missouri is really good defensively, folks. They are really good. There's a reason why they can barely score 24 points just about every time they go out on a football field and they still have chances to win. That's uh, that's probably the best way to put it. I mean, we talked about it earlier in the week. It's worth mentioning again. The magic number is 24 for Missouri. They they will go out there, and if you score 24, you are likely beating them. The only time that Missouri uh, has, you know what, the Missouri has barely gotten to 24 in some of these games. The only time Missouri has scored 24 points in a in a win against a Power Five opponent was last year against Arkansas, and 
you go and look up and down the board at games they won and lost last year, the difference maker would have been if the opponent scored 24 points in a lot of those scenarios. And I mentioned it earlier, it does not matter who they play. They they lost by a score to Georgia last year, and they only beat Vanderbilt by a score last year. They lost to a bad Kentucky team by a score last year. It, this South team Carolina. and South Carolina, they're like, this team is, is whack. The only team that blew them out last year was Tennessee, who had the best offense in the SEC until Hendon Hooker got hurt. So that's something to, to take note of there on Missouri. Let's let's flip it to the defensive side of the ball here, D.Y. Uh, we know who K-State has to worry about matchup-wise. That would be Luther Burden. He has been a focal point of the Missouri offense after the first 12 games of last season, legitimate questions about how Missouri was operating their offense, why certain guys were not getting the ball. They fixed that problem after they had some time to prep for their bowl game with Wake Forest. And in the last three games, Luther Burden has at least seven catches in all those games. He's gone for at least 90 yards in those three games after only having two occurrences prior to those three games where he had six catches at Missouri. So he is a talented player, and Missouri realizes it now, and they're getting him the ball more. Um, is, is your concern defensively for K-State in this secondary that's unproven, or does it fall somewhere else? I don't really have a giant concern just because Missouri offense doesn't scare me, and the Kansas State defense has exceeded expectations up to this point. If I was going to bring up you know, an item to watch, it is, you know, how do guys with that haven't started a bunch of games, Jacob Parrish and Willie, how did they handle Theo Wees and Luther Bird? So that's what I would point to. And then in terms, on the flip side, like what looks good, look, Kansas State Stevens of line has been really, really good. Um, they've really been really good at every level of the defense, but they control the line of scrimmage at both games. And like K-State, Missouri is off the line, off to a very slow start. So um, you know how you can make it difficult on Luther Burden? Make it so it's very complicated for Missouri to get him the ball. That means a big game for the defensive line. I think that's on the table with this Missouri O-line. Javon Foster is really good. Not sure any of the other four are. And there's even discussions about a true freshman getting his first career start at right guard. Well, that uh, I mean, that would sound like music to the cats' ears then, because uh, they've been really good up there so far this season. Khalid Duke, he's kind of looking like the guy that was promised heading into, I guess now it would be the the twenty twenty one season that Khalid Duke was getting all the talk. He got hurt early in the year, and then that was when the rise of Felix yeah, and DK Uzama came about. And so it's been a weird two years for Khalid Duke, who has still been a good player and productive at times, but. Now he's kind of going out there and showing off. And, and then, you know, he's gotten good help this year. Nate Matlack looks healthier. Brendan Mott has still gotten good pressure. And also, you've got a really good player behind them at linebacker and Austin Moore. Um, and so I'm with you as well on this. Missouri, outside of Burden, is, is not the most scary offense to go up against. And the one thing that goes into this, like being a receiver and getting the ball, it's not always up to you. It, it is up to your quarterback, and we know that Brady Cook is kind of shaky, and there's a reason why this team struggled in their FCS game to start the season, and then also with Middle Tennessee last year or last week. And you know, it, it probably boils down to, to Brady Cook just isn't uh, the the most talented guy at quarterback. Like Missouri has continued to have questions there. They had him last year, and they probably still have him this year. But Cook is the guy just because by default they don't have anybody better. Yeah, he's shaky. The offensive line is shaky. So, and with the way Kansas State's played up front, that can make it challenging to get Burton the ball. What I will say is the wild card here is that Brady Cook can run a little bit. He really can. Um, I don't know that he really exhibited that against Kansas State last season, at least not that I remember or that I can recall. And that was a monsoon of a game that, was really hard to track, hard to follow. Yeah. But but Brady Cook ended up with almost 700 yards rushing last year. Like he can go. It'll be uh it'll be good to watch. We'll see how it ends up playing out there. All right. We we've talked defensively, what's good is there I mean, is there anything else that stands out to you about K-State's defense versus Missouri's offense in this game that maybe is flying under the radar, should be talked about or should be noted because I mean, 
I just I think it's pretty straightforward here. I think as long as yeah, K State bottles up Luther Burden and you don't beat yourself in other ways, which is not characteristic of this K State defense right now, you should be in, in probably a pretty good spot. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. The only thing maybe something to watch and, and what they might do, Missouri is in the backfield, maybe a little bit of a change. I think the bulk of the touches so far have been for Cody Schrader. And and we, we keep better. So well we'll we'll uh we'll watch and see how it goes. Okay. Uh rolling on here, we'll we'll now kind of shift out of all of this and everything, uh, let's let's real quick. We'll change up the order here. I was gonna, you know, maybe save this for last, but we'll we'll dive into it right now, and then we'll close out uh, with our our game predictions and everything else that comes with it. Um, very briefly, give me the uh, the game MVP for K State, both offensively and defensively, if they win this game. Kind of alluded to it. Offense, Will Howard. I, mm-hmm. I think he has to be good. Uh, I really do. I, I think the receivers are going to be tested with the Missouri corners. I don't have the utmost faith yet in the offensive line. Missouri's really, really good across the board on defense. I, I kind of want to lean towards Ben Sinnott just because typically guys that good have a bounce back game, but I think Missouri might mimic Troy's game plan there. So then I want to steer away from him. So I think it has to be Will Howard on offense. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. I'm with you on that. I'll jump in real quick. I mean, we talked about it, but it it is it's clearly a Will Howard game, uh, and he he will be you know the MVP or whatever. And I think he could I think he could come through. Like I think this is the the game where players of the caliber that is being expected of Will Howard. This is when they step up. So I I think that they can uh they can make it happen. Defensively, a, a little bit trickier here, right? Because. I feel pretty good about every level. I, I think the corners might have their hands full. I think they'll be up to the task. They might get a little help from the front. So I think everything is going – if Kansas State wins, everything's going to be predicated on still dominating that line of scrimmage, still uh, doing what you did the first two games. And I think everything has been, de- been dependent on, I want to say, front seven, but I guess it's more like front six based on the scheme, although they do have a seven guy up. Um, the pass rush has been good, but Brady Cook has the mobility to make that challenging to complete the actual statistic revelation of a sack. Um, just because of his, like I said, his, his mobility, he can really get yards on the ground. I want to say, especially if a if Mizzou does resort to a really young player there at right guard. And at the very least, a new starter potentially at right guard, and how weak they've kind of been on the interior. Now, a tackler, not bad, but Javon Foster, but on the interior is really where their questions have loomed. Another game of comfort, another game of probably better conditioning, and another game of becoming fresher and, and really ready to go. Watch out for Uso Sayamala this game, I think. Well, and I mean, that, that was another guy that a lot of talk and a lot of hype off season. This is kind of where you could go out and prove yourself a little bit uh, if you're Uso. And obviously the, there was the injury concern early in the year. That seems to be, you know, mostly by the wayside now. So you can kind of go out and prove it. For me, defensively, I mean, I, I think it's probably going to come down to, to guys stepping up in the secondary. I mean, you think about where K-State really just – finish things off last year in the game it came when that stretch where Missouri threw interception after interception and in turn I mean that a lot of what we've seen K-State why they've been able to force interceptions the last couple of years it's because the pass rush has set it up by getting back there I mean that's that's a part of this so like Khalid Duke Brennan Mott those guys they need to be good this week but because it's an unproven secondary and they struggled through the first two games to do this, they only have one interception through these two against lesser competition. It's going to come down to one of the, the guys in the secondary stepping up and actually making the play when the chance is there for when a ball flutters your way and you have a beat on it as a defensive back. So I, you know, he had the pick last week. 
I'm going with Will Lee needing to have a big game here for K-State because I think he's the guy that probably has the most killer instinct when it comes to trying to make those plays, uh, looking for the football, trying to force turnovers, because that's another way where K-State can go out and shut any Missouri momentum down immediately is if they get out there and they are able to convert with forcing some turnovers. And, and if you want to get to know Will Lee a little bit more, that was uh, one of our three-mile podcasts this week that Cole Manbeck does uh, on a weekly basis uh, with Riverbank Brewing and Council Grove. Shout out. As the sponsor, as Mason's well aware of the Council Grove area. I think I said their company right, but um, yeah, that's an NIL deal where they bring on a, a player, excuse me, a player e- each week. Last week, I believe it was Uso. This week, Willie. Well, uh, I, I've actually been to Riverbank Brewing in Council Grove uh, and also can confirm my grandmother, big fan. So she is, uh, she, 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 any t- chance she gets to talk up the brewery, she does. She loves going down there. So, I've been there. It is a uh, it is a staple of my family. Uh, whenever uh, we are in Council Grove, so there you go. Uh, that is the that is the testimony, and I'm not even making the money off of it. Sounds like Cole Manbeck is. So uh, yeah, shout no, out to no, Cole. No. Well, and Will Lee and Uso. and Will Lee, yeah, <laughs> and Will Lee. So uh, if you know if you're worried about uh, why is Cole getting the money, it, Will Lee also getting money and other players. So uh, really good. And it was a great listen too. Okay, so we've talked about who should step up, who should be the MVPs. What's your game prediction? You know, maybe the way the game paces out and then a final score. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty tight for the most part. I think Kansas State just scores enough, maybe a, a big play by Will Howard at some point in the second half, screeches across the finish line. 27 eclipses that magic number for a 27-19 win. Okay. Well, there you go. I, I was going to see where you maybe sided with how many points you thought Missouri got because – we know that no, that's the area that they're no, lacking. Yeah. Here's what I'll say, and probably maybe get people off my back a little bit. I <laughs> I, I think you can say people, fans alike, probably put a little too much stock into last year's game uh, and maybe a little bit too comfortable, too confident. I think Missouri is better than what most folks would imagine. I, I think it's going to be tight. In a normal situation – I would say eh, I would probably take Kansas State to win 31-14-ish. But you got two things working against Kansas State for this one. One, you're on the road for the first time in the year with a lot of young players on defense, and it's going to be a rowdy at Mizzou, and it's going to be a really good environment. Um, not to speak, talk up you know, Columbia and Furrow Field very much, but it's going to be a really good environment Saturday, the best one they've had, at least for an on-conference game in several years. And two, there's a reason why Mizzou barely beat Middle Tennessee. It's not because they suck. Maybe it is because they suck. We'll find out. But I don't think it is. I think it's because this is the game they've been waiting for 10 months for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, this is a, there's extra motivation here with how it plays out. Look, I, I think that the way this thing happens, I think it's probably – Within striking distance, it's close at halftime. Uh, Scott Wildcat called me in yet again to try and deliver uh, a K State win via the, the primer for their show. Um, and, and here I, I said to him, you know, he's looking for like a specific prediction inside the game. We haven't seen it yet this year. He did it last year to him. It's time for Phillip Brooks to step up. So I think it's close at halftime. K State gets the ball to start the second half, and we see a Phillip Brooks kick return in the game. I think he takes a kick back. We've seen him take punts back. I think he pops off a kick return. He also in turn proves that Elijah Rinkwitz actually knows what he's talking about sometimes in the game of football, that Phillip Brooks is the straw that stirs the K-State drink. Like maybe that is the thing that's going to happen. So I think it's close at halftime. I think it's probably a little bit of an offensive battle. I mean, we're probably looking at like, I wouldn't be shocked if it's like 17 to 17 to 10 at halftime or something or like 17 to seven. And it feels like, Hey, anything could kind of happen here. And then eventually K-State's able to lengthen that thing out a little bit. I think the Wildcats are able to score a little bit in this game. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say K-State 31, Missouri 17. 
Um, that's also probably different than what I said when I recorded the primer for, for Bosco's boys. So if you listen to both of these today or one today and one on game day, and you're thinking to yourself, this dude is high as a kite. Why is he picking two different scores? It's because I can't remember what I said when I recorded that. It was like, it was like two in the morning when I recorded that. And also I, you know, Colin Cowherd, we got new information. I reserve the right to change my mind. Blah, 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 blah. I really, I have no explanation for it. I'm just second guessing what I actually picked. So. There you what's go. the what's the new information? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the new information is that I might be a dumbass for how I I picked the score earlier today. That's the that's the only new information that I can provide in here. And a lot of people are listening and saying, "How's that new information? We've known this all along." So I don't know. I don't know. What the, to new, tell you. the new information I got this week is Christian Duffy's name might actually be Chris Gaffey. So if you listen to a, a Mizzou podcast, that uh, oh, Christian okay. Duffy. <laughs> I thought I thought we were dealing with like a Fausto Carmona situation or something where you know all of a sudden his his life has been a lie, uh, and and all of a sudden a new new name has popped up. Danny so. Almonte, you know, just cheating on the little league little league uh, circuit there. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, well, okay. Uh, you know, one time I read the the book Heat by Mike Lupica. Um, it was like a children's baseball book. Very good book to read, but it like kind of hit on a situation similar to that. And it just made me think that like every time I went out onto a baseball field when I was younger and I was playing like a group of kids, uh, we had a tournament one time specifically against a team from Ulysses. And I was like, Oh yeah, these kids, they're like 17 out there playing against us 12 year olds right now. That's, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, turns out like some kids just, you know, mature a lot quicker than Mason both did. And they look like grown men and they can hit the baseball a lot further than I could at that age. But, you know. The pride of Ulysses, former Kansas State linebacker Ian Rudzik. Ian Rudzik. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, trust me. I, I saw the Bueller Crusaders play Ian Rudzik and the Tigers a couple times. Uh, I hope I, if you're listening to this, Ian Rudzik, give us a shout out on Twitter. <laughs> yes. Shout out to Ian Rudzik. Man, all those, all those Western Kansas boys, Ian Rudzik. I, I, I was going to say Alex Delton, not really technically uh, Western Kansas. I would say like Hayes is Western Kansas, but it's like the fringe. I think for people like the east side of the state that don't really understand like geography, and they're like, oh, I I live with uh, my first year at K State. I lived with three guys from Olathe, and they were talking like Manhattan was Western Kansas, and then I they were like, well, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from Hutchinson. And they said, oh, you're way out there. And I was like, no, Western Kansas does not start in Hutch or anywhere <laughs> past it. Like, you have to get basically under the little, like, turnaround bridge that takes you to, like, Wichita from Salina. You basically have to get under that, and that's, like, the gateway to the West in Kansas. But even that is a little for dicey. Me, for, for me, it's, like, anything beyond Salina, I think. That's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's the that's the gateway to the West. You know, St. Louis in the United States, we have the arch. Uh, now, now we have there, a we have a freeway there, in Salina that that marks it in Kansas. Okay, is there a part of Kansas where you'd say you're pretty much Colorado and you don't count? Uh, yeah. Well, Colorado for one. Uh, mm-hmm. th- even though that is like technically, but, basically, you are Colorado and you do not count. Uh, I would also say. For the time, for the time being, since they they have someone that's of importance to Kansas State, um, Goodland is allowed to be in Kansas, right? Uh, yes, the, yeah, Goodland they count as Kansas if uh, if they have a player that goes to K State, uh, <laughs> and they count as an in-state win. <laughs> if it doesn't go their way, then yeah, that's basically Colorado out there. <laughs> You're you know. I mean, if you go and look at one of those schedules for those Western Kansas teams, like the way Western Kansas teams, and you're going through and you're like, oh, okay, you're playing teams from Colorado and Oklahoma, it, you're barely in Kansas. We're only counting you on, like, the postal code. Although, because of the because conference realignment has also hit Kansas yes. high school football, Manhattan and Junction City have to go out there a lot. Yeah, uh, I don't envy those trips when I see – School like schools like Junction City going to Dodge City for a game. Ugh, tough. That's tough. All right. We've talked enough about Kansas geography here. Some people probably loved it. Others like, good Lord, get me out of this thing. Let's move on here. Uh, time for a little best bets action 
this week, D.Y. Okay, we've refined this segment down. It took us three weeks to get to this point. It took a little bit of planning by me and just prepping ahead of time, being like, hey, how about you give me three bets that you really like this week? I'll give three of mine, and then we will put them up, and now we'll start tracking them. We will have them. And then, of course, if anything else comes up, we're good to go. And uh, we'll I'll flash the graphic up on the screen. I will say I might want to change a little bit how we pick this because I don't want us to have the same picks, but you had two picks that I absolutely loved that I've been trying to talk some buddies into. Uh, I'll let you I'll let you start by explaining your picks as I throw them up. If you're watching on the YouTube, you can see our picks right there. I'll let D.Y. Uh, explain his right now. Now, with the whole Ben Senate thing, I do have some reservations, because as I've alluded to, I do think Missouri might set out to take him away. But a guy that is completely non-existent for one game that is that good typically is really good the next week and i i don't know what the odds are right now off the top of my head but a ben sent a touchdown is like stealing money for where they've set it i think it's like plus three plus four hundred something um, yeah yeah it's all dude ben sent it two touchdowns is plus 1500 if you want to get really really groovy but yeah let's get wild yeah so i mean <laughs> go for it now, Colorado, 41 and a half, a big number. They got 36 on a pretty good Nebraska defense, right? Yeah. They they scored all kinds of points on TCU. They played Colorado State, who gave up like a million points to Washington State not long ago. So over on the Colorado point total. And KU, I'll just say this, guys, Nevada might be the worst team in college football. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's hit on that real quick because – uh, Jay Norvell finding a way to basically make his way into two picks here. Uh, yeah, I'm picking. I'm I'm with you on the KU minus 27 and a half. If you can get it at that number, some places opened, still had it, it there. It 26 and a half. Yeah. yeah, some some had moved up to 28. I'd still be tempted to take that. KU that offense is the real deal, and Nevada flat sucks. Jay Norvell left them in a terrible spot just to go to Colorado State and not have them in a good spot yet, and also decide to poke the bear of Deion Sanders. So you have Colorado over 41 and a half. I like the Buffaloes to just rip them apart in this game. Night game in Boulder. I'm taking the Buffaloes minus 23 and a half. I'm taking K-State minus three and a half as well against Missouri. I think if K-State wins this game, it is by just over that number. Like It could be close, but I think this is probably a spread that K-State can cover. And then the other one I'm throwing out there, a top 10 Washington team on the road at Michigan State. Uh, a lot of you that follow college football probably know why I'm taking this right now. I don't think Michigan State has had the best week possible in preparation for taking on the Huskies. So I think Washington on the road wants to, to blow out a Power 5 opponent. They get their chance at a Michigan State team that is probably not too terribly focused, uh, at least on the football or wondering what the heck is going on with their suspended head coach at this point in time in Mel Tucker. And speaking of distractions, I kind of wanted to go Oklahoma as well because under Brent Venables, <laughs> they just demolish bad teams. Like yes. whenever they play an average to solid team, they're in trouble. But whenever they played like dog crap teams, they win by like 80 and they're playing a dog crap team in Tulsa this week. The, the Golden Hurricane are not what they used to be. But yep. I kind of hesitated just because I don't know – if everybody is committed to that game as, as much as they typically are, just because it seems like the whole Jeff Levy thing kind of um, stirred things up for a few days. Yeah, boy, it's a uh, it's been a tough week for some of these some of these coaches out there. Uh, yeah, Jeff Levy with hey, he's just my father in law. He's guys spending time with his family. Well, you know what? That is fine in most circumstances, but if your father in law and the grandfather of your children is Art Bryles, maybe think about where he's going to be uh, when he comes to support you. That would just be my advice to, to Jeff Levy. And you're right. Oklahoma at Tulsa, very tempting. Oklahoma's minus tw or 27 and a half right now, or at least it's, the last time I saw it. So Minus minus the Le Levy ordeal, that's very similar to like how you would should feel about the KU game. Yep. I, would say. Yep. I would agree with that. All right, let's move on to the Big 12 scoreboard. Obviously, we've already mentioned a couple of games. I'll throw them up here if you're watching on the YouTube. Here's a look at the early kickoffs. Uh, on the Big 12 weekend, K-State at Mizzou. We've obviously covered that. Uh, Baylor gets their cupcake. This is the, you know, the, if get right we don't here. win this one, we're screwed. 
game. Get right. uh, Get right. Owen, Get yeah, right Owen two Long Island comes in. They are not the Blackbirds anymore. They are the Sharks. Uh, so no longer LIU Brooklyn. Like they are that. the Sharks. Ooh. Yeah, might- and they've gone from like an ugly black and gray to like a baby blue and uh, like yellow color. So they've spruced things up in Long Island. That that's like the best rebrand ever. We're going to be the Sharks, which is awesome, and our <laughs> colors are actually cool now. Yeah, there you go. Uh, also, the the third and final 11 a.m. kick of the weekend. This is weird, and I mentioned it, I think, earlier in the week, work. but there are three Big 12 teams on the road at group of five opponents this week. Iowa State will kick it off. They are on the road at Ohio. This is kind of an intriguing game, if you ask me, D.Y., to kind of see what Iowa State is this year. Obviously, we know the offense is still probably pretty wobbly. I don't think they're a great team. But even a not so good Big 12 team should be able to go on the road and beat an opponent like Ohio, who I mean, they're two and one to start the season. Their loss is the San Diego State, who is not the same San Diego State team that we've been accustomed to for probably the last decade in college football. Still wouldn't shop me if Iowa State lost just because they are playing on the road and they don't have the offense to pull away. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then OU Tulsa, we mentioned that a little bit as well. <laughs> yeah. Here are the early night kickoffs. If you love ESPN Plus, 5 30 <laughs> to 6 o'clock is your place for Big 12 football. Uh, Villanova at UCF. This one is interesting just from the standpoint of what is UCF going to look like without John Race Plumley on the field because you're going to be breaking in a new backup quarterback, getting him into game action, and telling him, hey, we need you to get ready because K-State is next week, and then we've got more trouble coming after that in the Big 12. That's really the only intrigue in that game. And then Cincinnati hosting Miami of Ohio also uh, I, kind of intrigues me because I think Cincinnati has played better recently than uh, what one would have expected this season. They have, and, and a game we didn't get to yet, that another the upset alert, I would say, Iowa State when they're playing Ohio, of course, on the road. Mm-hmm. South Alabama is kind of good for a group of five team folks. Like yep. Oklahoma State better be on alert. Yeah, and Oklahoma State, similar to what we've talked about with like Missouri already and Iowa State, they seem to lack the offense this year to be able to totally put a team away. I mean, in two games this season, Oklahoma State has scored 27 in both games, and that came against Central Arkansas and Arizona State. So it doesn't matter if they're playing an FCS school or a Power 5 school. They're just not scoring a ton with that three-quarterback system they're running out right now. And then Texas Tech, similar boat to Baylor. It's a get-right game. you got to win that one. Their FCS opponent, Tarleton State, comes in uh, at 6 o'clock to Lubbock. Uh, I mean, it would not totally shock me if the loss to Oregon last week on top of the opening loss to Wyoming breaks the spirit a little bit of Texas Tech, and that's a game where there may be a little sleepwalky and Tarleton State is it hangs around, and, and there are some eyebrows raised a little bit longer than what people expect. See, I'm a little bit different. I think Texas Tech takes all their anger from the two weeks out on Tarleton State. So it made me think of another bet. I don't know if I'll take it, but the over points total, just Tech, I might look at it. They might try to hang 70. That's a good point. Yeah, that that wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world, probably. Um, it, it's one of those games where you got to go out and assert your dominance, basically, if you're tech. And it's you're not going to like win it all back, essentially, if that's how you want to phrase it. But if you go out and just kick some butt there, you, you feel better about heading into conference play. And then at that point, maybe uh, some people buy back in. All right, the final wave of games. These games all kicking after 6.30 on Saturday. BYU on the road at Arkansas. I hate to break it to the Cougars. I don't know that things are going to go well for them. Um, I just I don't think BYU is that good this year. And nope. then this is the next game. I, I already mentioned it earlier. Uh, Pitt at West Virginia, 630 ABC. Why is this the Saturday night primetime game? It's beyond me, but Pitt at West Virginia. I think you're probably sick in the head if you're trying to figure out which one of these teams is going to actually win it because I think they both might suck. Uh, yeah. But if I had to pick one, I actually think this is a game that – I don't know. That West Virginia crowd is going to be pretty pumped up to have Pitt in in Morgantown and everything. I just think they're both bad. I, I have no idea where to go. West Virginia is a one-and-a-half-point favorite right now. Yeah, I have no idea either. I would just say coin flip, just pick the home team. So that's why I, I would be on West Virginia. And if that happens, I'll just call Pittsburgh forever the Big 12 punching bag. 
<laughs> there you, yeah, exactly. That loss to Cincinnati last week at home. Uh, that's not, it's not what you want. TCU in Houston, first big 12 game of the year, seven o'clock on Fox. This game would feel a little bit different if Houston had not <laughs> pooped the bed against Rice last week. Instead, yeah. they did. They're one and one. TCU trying to still kind of get back on track from the opening loss to Colorado, which is proving to not be such a bad loss. Yeah. TCU's defense is not good, but Colorado's offense is really good. TCU did keep up, only lost by a field goal. I think TCU probably stomps through Houston on Saturday night. I agree, but the better bet might be the over. There might be a lot yeah. of points. Good call. Uh, final 7 o'clock game, Longhorn Network, so nobody's going to be watching it. Texas off their big win. They get Wyoming. Uh, I don't know that there's much that's going to happen here. Texas is going to win the game, but as we saw, like they didn't cover against Rice, which was kind of weird to start the season, so I probably wouldn't touch anything in this game except for maybe betting on Xavier Worthy getting a touchdown. Um, but Texas and Wyoming is there if you want it. Yeah, I call it the transitive property game because – I think Texas Tech and Texas fans are both going to probably draw too many conclusions from it than they should. Yeah, that's probably a good point. Uh, last game of the night, little uh, Big 12 after dark. Get used to it starting next year. It'll be a more common occurrence, but the Jayhawks get it underway this year. 9.30 kick, CBS Sports Network, KU on the road at Nevada. As we've established, Nevada is terrible. KU is a very, very capable offense. They are probably going to put up a lot of points on Nevada. I mean, if if you had a guess right now, how many points do you think Kansas scores in that game Saturday night? 56. I That's the number I was leaning towards. So I'm glad we're uh, kind of in step there with that one. Yeah, this is uh, the Jalen Daniels. I got to catch up to be the Big 12 Offensive Player of the Year, this Heisman candidate, yeah. whatever, whatever game. And, and they run it up, I think. They run it up a lot. Yep. Nope. That's a, that's a good call. All right. Well, that will uh, clean things up. We've gotten through it all here as uh, we wind down this edition of the KSO show, getting ready for K-State and Missouri. Any final thoughts before we get out of here and uh, give way to people's Fridays into the work week, or if you're listening on your way to Columbia and uh, getting ready for game day, uh, what, what do the people need to know about things going on at K-State online or just, you know, anything in general about the Wildcats that they should be excited about. Just one last point on the game. I got it a bit of a dog fight, but if it was to not be a dog fight, it's probably because Kansas State comes out, punches Missouri right in the mouth from the get-go, hops up two diff- two scores or something, 10 nothing, 14 nothing. Missouri gets a little bit deflated, but also when you do that to a team like Missouri, you make them throw when – you know they're going to throw. And because Brady Cook is not that adept in that department, that really takes Missouri out of their game plan, in my opinion. So for it to not be the dogfight that a lot of us are kind of predicting it to be, a fast start by Kansas State just step on their throat right out of the gate, that's probably what would happen to alleviate from that um, occurring. In terms of KSO, all, all the stuff uh, – I think you guys are into a game Friday night. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're listening to this later tonight, uh, I'm going to see what how many how many state titles is Mill Valley won in a row now? Um, four? Is that four in a row? Oh boy, I'd have to. Yeah, I, don't, I can't <laughs> think how many it's, they've racked up, but yeah, they're on a roll. It's in that ballpark where at one time I said I'm probably going to offend some people, but at one Uh-oh. point it was very apparent that the program the high school program, best high school football program in the state was either Derby or Bishop Miege. Nobody was touching those two. Now it's Mill Valley, and I don't yeah, think there's right. even a discussion at this point. Although, and they got to they gotta get some rings to show for it, Wichita Northwest is not very far from it. They are mm-hmm. uh, like a Mill Valley in development almost is how I would describe them, and you probably get to see them more than anyone. So, and – as always, you know, you, if you're curious about K State Online, haven't been a member yet, try us for a dollar. Um, first month's a dollar if you're just curious, want to see what you're getting yourself into and see if it's for you. It's only a dollar for the first month, and then we'll go from there. And the app continues to get better. You basically get K State Online at the tip of your fingers whenever we produce content, go straight to your phone. So sign up for the app, it's a great tool. It is. It is an awesome tool. And uh, yeah, the, the one thing that I was going to plug 
is yes, Jade Woods will be in attendance tonight. Drew and I, a little, little brief, little brief pit stop. Oh yeah, and Gus Hawkins, a little brief pit stop there on the on the way to to Columbia. Be a little late night rolling in. Well, uh, D.Y. will have the bed ready for us in the hotel room, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll probably be snoring already. I mean, it'll be like midnight when you get in at the earliest. Yeah. It'll be it'll be all right. It'll be a fun night uh, getting out there. Weather should be good as long as, uh, you know, some of the storms and rain that we're going to see, uh, at least in my part of the state, kind of stays away for uh, Friday night. But it'll be a good time. Check everything out. Obviously, Drew will have great coverage of that on K-State Online and uh, we'll certainly have some stuff up on the YouTube as well from that game. Just uh, if anybody's interested in those highlights of what a future cat could possibly look like, Jaden Woods possibly in the mix there, Gus Hawkins as well as D.Y. mentioned. So that will do us do it for us here on K-State Online. Make sure that if you are not hanging out with us over on KSO, you do so as soon as you can. And then also be subscribed to the YouTube and podcast channels to get the content instantly when uh, it comes available, whether it's these podcasts or it ends up being press conferences and any other videos from K-State Online.